how to get a girlfriend or boyfriend? Yeah. <laughs> Don't work in the lab. The Like, pasteurization is a really important process because uh, there, microbes can do a lot of crazy things. They can, they can do a lot of things that, that can throw off your balance inside of you, and they can do a lot of things that directly harm you. And so while it might taste better because you know you have these microbes in it, it won't taste better the second time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the risk is low from, from a lot of these types of things, like, like unpasteurized milk get yeah, raw milk and all of this, but there's, the health benefits are non-existent or exaggerated, I think, so. <laughs> it, it depends on how fast you can drink the milk. <laughs> <laughs> on a similar note, you guys talked about GMOs yesterday, and there's all this big wave of like, you know, no GMO this, and like blah 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 that, and I'm, re I'm very suspicious of like these trends. What so, if I told you you could have sustainably grown organic GMOs? <laughs> so so before, we, before we did all the modification to plants that we do today, we used to just bombard them with radiation and make a ton of mutations until it gave us what we wanted. So we didn't call it GMOs then, and everyone wasn't worried back in like the 50s. So I think we're all right. That might be some bias on my part, but um, yeah, the, uh, the other really cool thing about GMOs is that um, when you're designing a GMO, you have to actually look for other genes that might cause problems with the inserted gene. Like, we don't just like, oh, I want this apple that tastes like an orange now. Uh, you know, just orange genes and that'll be fine. Like, we actually, like, screen the, like, the genome and make sure there's something that could interview, hypothetically. Um, and so when I go to the store and I see GMOs, I think two things. One, they're cheaper, and I'm poor. And the second thing is, this is probably going to be more nutritious than a non-GMO product. Well, it has been studied scientifically, so, I mean, well, there may be, like, fractional differences in the nutrients between GMOs and non-GMOs. There's no health reason to avoid GMOs. They've been proven to be safe. It, of course, it's always going to be on a GMO by GMO basis. Like, they're not all, it depends what is the change, what is the modification. And so it's always going to be different. Um, my favorite though is when people were freaking out about like putting fish genes in like a tomato or something, and it's just like, what if I told you when you eat a fish, you're just eating thousands of fish genes? <laughs> I, I think well, one thing that's really interesting about this this GMO is kind of people are equivocating terms, so people are confusing certain things. For example, like Monsanto is kind of synonymous yeah. with GMO in a lot of these conversations when it really shouldn't be. So whether or not a company is that say owns half the world's food supply or half the world's seeds or whatever, or a large portion of it. Whether or not that company is acting ethically is a different conversation than whether or not that GMO is safe to consume or to say, there's even other, like Chago's gonna talk about it a little bit today, there are GMOs that we're not consuming that we're using to do all kinds of beneficial things, like we're finding ways to uh, use salmonella as a vector for delivering vaccines, right? Um, we're finding ways to uh, alter bacteria so that they can extract more CO2 from the atmosphere so that we can reduce greenhouse, ga uh, yeah, reduce greenhouse gases while at the same time creating biofuels. And we're also trying to discover ways to make crops that, say, require less inputs, like less phosphorus inputs or less nitrogen inputs. So then you have to use less fertilizer, and as a result, you get less contamination from that fertilizer into water beds and water streams, which is actually a huge problem here in the United States. If you look in the Gulf of Mexico, where uh, uh, all the rivers kind of flow into out, out of the Mississippi, right? You have a huge eutrophication zone, right? So you have a huge dead zone because of all of these nutrients that are washing in there from all of the agriculture that we do. So GMOs, they have so much to offer us, so many benefits. And I think a lot of times that argument is just a matter of whether or not a certain company that's using GMOs has the best company practices, and that's a completely different discussion. Right, and then none of this means that we should support companies that are doing shady or horrible things. It's just unfortunate they're big and big so often. Yeah, speaking on Monsanto, Monsanto's actually, from the numbers I know, the third large, or um, yeah, I guess the way I phrase that is the third largest company in that sector. So there's two bigger companies that no one knows the name of. I don't remember the name of them, and I learned about them. 
and probably none of you have heard the names of them. So there, there are two larger companies that are doing good GMO work that aren't in the spotlight because they haven't done anything unethical, and then you have Monsanto, which everyone sort of raves about because it's the one they know about and it's the one that comes up in common conversation. There is actually going to be a panel on this, I think, tonight. Uh, if you want all the controversies all in one, we're talking about GMOs, evolution, climate change, and vaccines all in one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just think of the people. Sorry. <laughs> what? What's one tonight more? at nine? I believe it's called No Controversy to Teach. Yeah. 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 Well, one more cool thing I'll mention about GMOs before we move on to the next question is that uh, so there's this fish that can exist in uh, Arctic temperatures, right? So this fish can exist uh, temperatures extremely close to zero or even slightly lower than zero. And they have found out which gene in this fish allows it to have this kind of anti-freezing agent, and they've actually found a way to use that in ice cream. <laughs> so you can have lower fat ice cream that is a lot smoother in texture and taste to the more traditional ice cream. And so you have these like different completely different churning methods that you can use now to make uh, lower fat ice cream almost as good as, or I think as good as the other kind. So uh, you can thank GMOs for your delicious ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> now, you gotta remember also that like, some people might say that that's like putting antifreeze in your ice cream, but it's not really the same thing. They're not taking the like chemical that you put in your car with like antifreeze. It's a fish antifreeze gene, and so it's if you if you subscribe to that whole theory that you know it's a natural thing. These things are coming from nature. We're taking genes from living things that are making the fish die. Because if we were to give like car antifreeze to this fish, it would die. Probably, maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, if you're eating fish, you're eating these same things anyway. Yeah. It's just same fish. On the antifreeze note, we actually drink antifreeze. If you know the like Mio squirt things, you put in water to flavor it. The sweetener that is a chemical that's in antifreeze. So if you drink too much of that, you can get stomach bleeding, and that's why <laughs> antifreeze tastes sweet. So we do it anyway. Uh, we're we're not the <laughs> I do not support oh, yeah. making oh, antifreeze. Yeah. 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 I do not support anything you just said. Yeah. I don't support it either. So uh, the Mio like, water flavor, I think okay. it's called Mio. It's in a little like, granular yeah. thing. Don't drink that. Yeah, don't drink that. <laughs> What's the sweet berry? Yeah. 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 Well, that's not a good thing. It might have changed. I know uh, my. my Auto tech teacher, because I was an auto tech for a short time. His wife went to the doctor with stomach bleeding, and they traced it back to that. They probably have changed it by now, hopefully, but that was the way it was four years ago. Yeah, the moral of the story is just don't drink an entire bottle of like Vio. It's, it's not a good thing to do, anyways. You'll probably feel really sad afterwards. <laughs> no, I think it's. Uh, yeah, like this. yeah, maybe. Well, uh, yeah, we have four more we minutes. Like They're still coming in. Anyone else? Want to throw something out? Yeah. This is a really simple question. Are you doing a panel tomorrow or Saturday? Which panel are you talking about? Just with you guys. I went to one yesterday. Oh, yeah. I think we're all doing various panels, right? So I'm, I'm doing the No Controversy to Teach one tonight, and then also uh, Victorian Medicine tomorrow, and a couple of you guys are on that. But there are... I might speak on that one. <laughs> We'll, we'll see if there's any space on it. Yeah, I'm on the Victorian and Aaron Medicine one as well. Um, I'm on a panel tomorrow at 4 o'clock called Weird Science, the science behind the headlines. It deals with like weird science experiments like putting ants on stilts and seeing what happens. Uh, so that's, that's that. I'm on a tea drinking panel, well, tea and coffee panel, where I think I know what I'm talking about, but we'll see. And then I'm also on the Science of HP Lovecraft panel which I'm going to talk about some genetic stuff on that, and that's Sunday at 3. Those who have Cthulhu uh, in, their, in their green farms. Yeah. Yeah. No one should fall asleep during the coffee panel, right? Okay. How coffee panel? I hope not. I drank plenty of coffee this morning, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wired. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank all right, welcome to You've Got a Friend in You. How many of you were also at the micro panel last time? Yeah, we're new customers. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> we might touch on a few of the things we touched on now, but hopefully we're going to expand it. It's a lot of really cool areas. Awesome. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, is everything good? All right, so I'm going to be giving you guys a very brief intro to microbes in general, and then these guys are going to take a What's your name? 
Hi, my name is Andy. Hi. I'm a European rock star. Wait, what? Um, okay. So microbes are, in fact, sorry. I'm just kind of like right next to <laughs> the microbes are literally everywhere. They cover pretty much every surface, even surfaces that you may not even think about as anything possibly living. So we have them deep underground, in hydrothermal vents in the ocean, in these acid pools and hot springs, even buried inside of frozen glaciers. We even have them in places where we would just, just never imagine anything could possibly live even just a few years ago. So for example, this guy, Cryptococcus neoformans, actually a fungus, and it was found living off of nuclear waste in Chernobyl. Why not? They pretty much take gamma radiation and do like what plants do with photosynthesis. They're like, yeah, just give me that nuclear waste. I'll eat that, no problem. So I have a question for all of you. If you were to roll into a giant ball all of the animals on the planet, and just make a giant animal ball, and then you were to roll all of the bacteria into a big bacteria ball, and you were to compare the sizes of them, raise your hand if you think the animal ball would be bigger. Can we try it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So delicious. Right, well, this is the micro channel, so the answer is obvious, but it turns out, in fact, the micro ball would be about a thousand times bigger. So even though we can't see them, they are truly everywhere. And that includes inside of your body. So we have about 10 trillion cells that make us us. And there's up to 10 times this many microbial cells inside of us. Now, they're a lot smaller, right? You know, we, we don't look like microbes. I mean, I don't know. But uh, maybe it looks like a microbe. But um, so it takes up about two to seven pounds of our weight is microbes. It's fill, filling us. All right. Um, so interestingly, so these microbes, every single multicellular organism that has ever been discovered is pretty much covered with microbes. And they don't just like, we think of microbes so often as being bad. You know, we have to wash our hands to get rid of the germs. Well, most of these things are living symbiotically. They're harmless or they're actually beneficial. Um, the ones that actually cause disease are a minority. And we don't, we don't always necessarily think of it that way. It's really only, like, for the vast majority of history, medicine has been about getting rid of germs. And it's only in recent years that we've started to realize that a lot of these things are necessary for us to be healthy. Um, so we have bacteria, fungi, these newly, kind of newly discovered things called archaea, which are more similar to us than bacteria, but somewhere in the middle. Uh, viruses all over our skin, all of our muc mucosa, and in our gastrointestinal tract. Before, during, and after birth, we receive many microbes, both from our mothers and from the environment, and they play a role in disease. Maybe we have microbes that are preventing other pathogenic microbes from taking hold because the good ones are out competing them. They play a role in digestion, helping you break down food, helping you extract nutrients from the food. And there's a huge amount of research trying to look into all of the role that those things play in causing certain disorders when this balance of microbes gets disrupted. Um, they also play a huge role in the immune system, even regulating hormones, which I don't know, maybe I think we might talk a little bit about here. So for example, there's this thing called the gut-brain axis that is very new research that is looking into ways in which Hormones and things that affect us psychologically can be produced based on the microbes that we have living inside of our intestines. So I think all of these guys are going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, interesting one, have you heard of the hygiene hypothesis before? Just maybe just a couple of you guys. We have some here. Um, so it's currently, it's just an idea, but it is one that is gaining more and more traction, I feel like, every year, that the overuse of antibiotics and the hypercleanliness of Western society is actually doing us harm to some, in some cases. Um, it's disrupted the balance of microbes in us, and there's thoughts that that may contribute to certain, to certain things like eczema and asthma and those types of things. So it's definitely something that is not yet proven, but it's very interesting and is, has a lot of evidence to support it. So, uh, and there, there are many other really, really cool things that microbes do that we maybe don't think about. So, every one of our cells contains this enclosed structure that, you know, we eat food and our cells make energy from that food. And this is this thing that does it, although you've probably heard of it before, it's called a mitochondria. It's kind of just this little thing hanging out in our cells. Where people started to study it, they realized some interesting coincidences. So the mitochondria actually has its own DNA. And that DNA doesn't resemble our DNA. It resembles bacterial DNA. And not only that, but the mitochondria divides like a bacterial cell. So when our cells replicate, we have our own DNA and it gets replicated, but the mitochondria replicate separately. Um, and furthermore, we can't actually create new mitochondria. Our cells don't make new mitochondria. They just pass from one generation to the next. 
almost as if they're a separate organism within ourselves. Um, and so when scientists started to think about this, it was very, very interesting and strange and not what we would have originally expected. Um, and that's not the only example of this. So long before plants ever existed, the world only had cyanobacteria to do photosynthesis, so to take the energy from the sunlight and make energy out of it. Um, so cyanobacteria are green, shown here. They're green for the same reason that plants are green. Um, and it turns out that they have an enclosed structure also called a chloroplast that helps them do photosynthesis. Well, you guessed it, they look just like cyanobacteria. So it is now thought that both mitochondria and the chloroplast are actually ancestral bacteria that have lived symbiotically with our cells for as long as animals have ever been animals. Um, and so not only are we a collection of these 10 trillion human cells, not only are we covered from head to toe in microbes, but even inside of our very cells themselves, <coughs> every single one of them is an ancestral microbe that lives on today. All right. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> next, oh, my next. Yeah. Okay.